Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you all hear me? OK, um, I think we we ought to start this uh, this webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where, wherever you might be around the world. My name is uh, Diego Iturralde. I'm Chief Director for Demography and Population Studies at Statistics South Africa. Um, it's our pleasure to, to have you all here today. Um, I am aware that there are technical difficulties that some of you are encountering at this point in time. Um, we are trying to troubleshoot that and trying to get as many of you online. Uh, I have noticed that we do have 123 uh, persons who are online so far, so that's that's that that is a good sign. And I think uh, that being the case, uh, that we we can begin the formalities. Um, I want to first perhaps start off by indicating the background to this uh, series of webinars. Um, since 1994, the government of South Africa has, has uh, formed part of a range of partnerships to promote the progressive realization of a positive and inclusive demographic dividend in South Africa. Um, this, this partnership has come through the Department of Social Development uh, with, it, with the National Population Unit uh, seated there, Statistics South Africa, in collaboration with the African Union, with SADC, and with the regional office of the UNFPA. Um, the UNFPA's regional office has been a key partner in this, uh, in this regard, and the fifth country program, which stretches from 2020 to 2024, to support the government of South Africa in implementing um, uh, the objectives of this program is up and running in three provinces of the of the country. Um, this um, uh, five year program is consistent and it is in line with the medium term strategic framework with the national development plan and with the goals of the uh, sustainable development goals. The, the government of the United Kingdom is also a, a close partner of, of South Africa on um, population and sustainable development um, issues. And the two countries share uh, common approaches to population and, and development policies. Um, so we're extremely pleased that they are, they are part of this initiative and they are supporting us on the She Decides program, which, which uh, forms part of the, of the ICPD um, objectives and uh, which of course found resonance at the ICPD plus 25 meeting in Nairobi last year. Now the the whole focus of this um, of this webinar and this series of webinars is around COVID-19 and demography. So why demography in particular? So I think that population dynamics are important to any development strategy that a country seeks to implement and to this end many countries observe their population structure and trends to inform a holistic and multi-sectoral approach to sustainable development. Many countries in sub-Saharan Africa are youthful and this is reflected in their age structure. As a result, they have a huge potential to catalyze on a meaningful demographic dividend uh, from having a large proportion of potentially available persons devoted to the production and the socioeconomic development provided that the required social and economic investments have been made to, to realize their full potential. Such a scenario would boost the, effort, the efforts to achieve a wide range of goals from the Sustainable Development Goals. South, African and, uh, South Africa and other African countries have to invest and implement relevant policy actions in the, in the sphere of health, education and the economy in order to to capture and maximize this potential. Now, I think it, it goes without saying that COVID-19 has disrupted our, our lives in the continent as, as around the world like nothing else before um, from a social, economic and a health, health perspective. 
and uh, we need to consider how the pandemic interacts with population dynamics it's, and its implications for the demographic dividend. We also need to see how the post-COVID-19 recovery plans can be informed and sustained by evidence on population dynamics. The situation also provides an excellent learning opportunities for us to be able to know what will we do next time a crisis of this uh, magnitude hits us again. Um, and we need to make sure that that, that strategy relies on evidence uh, in order to overcome challenges from evidence gaps that may exist. So this webinar series uh, it will take place over the next four consecutive weeks um, is entitled Demography and COVID-19 in Africa, Evidence and Policy Responses to Safeguard the Demographic Dividend. Uh, we are joined as partners in this, in addition to the institutions that I've already mentioned by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the UK, um, the, the African Union, AFIDEP, who is hosting this webinar, uh, UAPS, the Union for African Population Studies, and the Population Association of Southern Africa, amongst others. The five um, <clears throat> webinars that will take place, the first one is the current one on the demographic impact of um, COVID-19, global, regional, and national experiences, and what does demographic data tell us about the population-wide impacts of COVID-19. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at an exploration of evidence-based service delivery in the times of COVID-19. Third webinar, we'll look at the actions taken by South Africa to adapt its policies and programs for the demographic dividend in light of COVID-19. And the fourth one will be an impact of COVID-19 on the African continent's prospects of harnessing the demographic dividend. The fifth and final one, which will be by, by invitation um, only, uh, will be a wrap up on policy recommendations and potential avenues to explore in a South-South trilateral cooperation on demography. Um, with that, with all of that said, I would then like to call on the Statistician General of South Africa, Mr. Rasenga Maroleke, to perhaps just say a few words of welcome with regards to the webinar series, whereafter I will formally introduce him and he will address us as the first presenter. Um, Mr. Maroleke, are you able to join us? Diego, shall I, shall I suggest that we start with Professor Charlotte Watts as we still try to get the other presenters on? Okay. Um, let me let me um, introduce uh, Professor Watts then. Um, Professor Charlotte Watts, CMG, is the Chief uh, Scientific Advisor and Director of the Research and Evidence Division at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, Professor Watts is seconded to the FCDO from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she's Professor of Social and Mathematical Epidemiology. Um, she is a global expert on violence prevention and was Senior Technical Advisor to the WHO's 10 country population surveys on women's health and domestic violence. She is a Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and Foreign Associate Member of the US National Academy of Medicine. She has 200 um, academic publications and in 2019 she was included in the Apolitical, the world's 100 most influential people in gender policy. So Professor Watts, it's our pleasure to welcome you and for you to take the floor. Great, thank you, and um, real pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, it's always so embarrassing when biographies get read. Um, you know, a real pleasure to be here, and and as a a partner who is 
very committed to how do we support and move forward on how do we really achieve the demographic dividend? I think, you know, engaging on this in the light of COVID is, is critical. So uh, a really important seminar series. Um, I'd be grateful if somebody could project my slides. Thank you. Can everybody see those? I, I can't hear if anybody can't, but hopefully they can. Um, so if I can go to the next slide, please. So um, I think everybody who's dialing into this is is aware of the importance of a focus on how do and the opportunity of how do we achieve the demographic di uh, dividend. As Diego said, there is an important opportunity of if you can achieve sufficient declines in fertility and also declines in um, maternal mortality and infant mortality and align that with appropriate investment in women's empowerment, in education, in job creation, that there's a really important opportunity in terms of growth and achievement if, of uh, the sustainable development goals. When we understand what are the factors that influence that combination of sex, of, of, six, of factors that lead to success, um, what we think about is a range of proximate determinants, and that includes things like access to sexual and reproductive health services, breastfeeding promotion, and so on. It also includes things such as access to maternal and newborn and child health services, as well as um, adequate nutrition and so on. And that's the sort of proximate determinants. But it also includes distal, distal determinants, so access to education, um, progress on achieving gender, gender equality and equality of opportunity, um, and of opportunities for income and employment. Next, next slide, please. So when we look at this at the sort of broad uh, global level and think about, well, how might COVID be playing out and impacting on this? Um, I think it's useful to think about, well, what is the evidence and what does the evidence tell us about how COVID is impacting on both those proximate and distal determinants? And what we're seeing from current evidence and evidence from a number of countries across sub-Saharan Sub Africa is how multiple and profound those impacts are. So, for example, if you look at family planning, we see that in the light of COVID, family planning services are being severely disrupted by COVID. And, and you know, there's data from Kenya that shows that quite clearly, but also there is um, modelling that estimates that um, there might be up to 15 million unintended pregnancies um, and more than 3 million unsafe abortions as a result of COVID. Um, we're also seeing a range of reports on the significance of service disruptions to, um, to maternal and child health services, which again is likely has the potential to impact on um, on, on maternal mortality and to increase rates of maternal and, and um, infant mortality. And across uh, South Saharan Africa, we're also seeing the growing threat of acute food and nutrition insecurity. Um, and you know, uh, you know, increasingly a major area of concern um, across the continent. Next slide, please. When we look also at what do we see in terms of the evidence of impacts on the, those distal determinants, similarly, we are seeing um, quite gloomy projections of the impact of, of COVID. So the World Bank, for example, projects that there might be between 26 and 40 million additional extreme poor in, across sub-Saharan Africa due to COVID. Um, if you look at access to income support, it is at best in across many countries partial um, and is leading to widespread reductions in household income. Similarly, if we look at issues such as access to, to education, early on in terms of lockdown, schools were closed universally. We are seeing now some opening up of schools, but also a need for um, continued access to remote education. And, and there, um, UNESCO estimates that there are many, uh, many children, significant numbers of children who do not have access to um, remote education. 
And lastly, if we're looking at broader indicators of women's economic and social empowerment, we're seeing quite strong trends on increased risk of violence against women and girls, um, with some projections that it might be up to a 25% increase. There are also concerns about significant risks in terms of rates of child marriage and adult uh, pregnancy. And when we look at the impacts on livelihood, if anything, the evidence points to a disproportionate impact on women's economic activity, um, and particularly as women are often in the lowest paid and most vulnerable sectors, COVID is impacting potentially disproportionately on their livelihoods. Um, and uh, again, UNESCO estimate that uh, about 11 million school girls may not go back to school um, even when restrictions are lifted on COVID. Next slide, please. So in terms of the UK's response, um, um, it has been significant. And, and if we just look at the development sector and our, our support internationally, um, the UK's um, mobilised more than £1 billion to try and support responses to combat COVID and reduce, um, reduce the secondary impacts and also support major initiatives such as production of effective vaccine. Um, it includes a wide range of activities. I'm not going to cover them here, but it includes support for the major UN appeals. That includes work on health and sexual and reproductive health, education, food and nutrition and um, economic options. Um, and it also includes work that focuses very much on the secondary impacts of, of tackling the secondary impacts of, of COVID. So some of the things I was speaking about just now, because we have sort of recognised quite early on that it's not only COVID and the response to COVID that is the threat to development, it's all those secondary impacts that we really need to be mobilising resource to try and mitigate and, and reduce. Um, and, and just to give you a feel of this, a couple of examples. One is um, uh, the Women's Integrated Sexual Health Programme, which has been supporting um, the continued delivery of sexual and reproductive health services uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa. And that includes um, trying to support the adaptation of services to respond to, to um, COVID across um, a number of countries. It includes um, reinforcing the importance of sexual reproductive health services as, a, as an essential service and really making progress on that commitment across a number of countries. It includes support for enhanced um, screening, counselling and communications on, on, on violence. Um, and also um, continued support and partnership with the AU on investments on the dem demographic in, um, in dividend. And similarly in, in education, a lot of work that has been trying to support the delivery of education or the transition to the delivery of educational materials through digital and remote services in, in a number of different countries. And we plan um, in 2021 um, to work with Kenya to co-host a high level summit um, to, to support and lead global action to educate every child and raise funds for the Global Partnership for Education. Next slide, please. Um, as Chief Scientist in FCDO and, and previously to that in DFID, um, I also oversee the um, R&D investments that we're making to try and tackle um, COVID. And we have flexed a range of our research and development programmes to think about how we respond and effectively to COVID and the secondary impact, impacts. And that includes research across a range of sectors, including governance, economics, education, agricultural resilience and humanitarian, as well as, as, well as quite significant investments in to support the rapid um, development of vaccines, diagnostics, the testing of treatments, um, as well as other work around hygiene, around infection control um, and, and broader epidemiological surveillance and support. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, in practice, that research, oh, the one before that, please. Uh, in practice, that research has been conducted with a range of partners, including a number of different partners uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, and it has spanned a range of different disciplines from the social science. So some really great work, for example, that we did in partnership with Kenry. It includes rapid social science report uh, support 
to help think about what are responses to COVID um, uh, and prevent some of the secondary impacts includes trying to support provision of better data on size of populations, locations of populations to support planning, as well as very gendered focus work around how do we think about economic opportunities and economic impacts on women of COVID. Next slide, please. I just want to flag as part of this how important some of the data that have been coming from South Africa has been for us in terms of just helping us try and get a sense of what is happening um, and what might be the distribution of infection and what might be some of the dynamics underlying uh, some of the cases, uh, what, we, what we're seeing from WHO reporting and other reporting about the numbers of case, uh, cases. So the plots on the left, for example, just show some of the early analysis, for example, that South African colleagues shared with us just about what you were seeing in South Africa about the age distribution of infection, you know, which was very important to kind of get a feel of, well, who is most vulnerable and 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 also what are we seeing in terms of the distribution of mortality between older age groups where we, we knew there was significant risk, but also potentially in, in younger age groups. Um, also, I'm, I'm really excited to be hearing in a minute some of the work that's been going on in South Africa about estimating ex excess mortality. This is an area where we've really, it's been really hard globally, or if you look across the continent, to get a feel of, well, how substantial is the impact, given the challenges of, of getting accurate estimates on, on mortality rates. And I think the data and analyses that South Africa have been producing have been critical. And also, I've been just hugely impressed by some of the scientific work being led and, and, and informing the South African response. So, for example, the work on super spreaders, some of the work around genetic sequencing, this has, I think, provided really important insights into the chains of transmissions and types of vulnerabilities that, that COVID preys on. Next slide, please. Um, and lastly, when we think forward to when we, we do get technologies and hopefully uh, a vaccine, I just wanted to stress as we think about what distribution strategies might look like. Um, we're seeing WHO starting to produce draft guidance on that, that highlights the needs of targeting uh, vaccines towards the most vulnerable populations, those who are most vulnerable to mortality, frontline workers, and so on. It's going to be very important that we apply a gendered and a demographic lens to that. We are seeing a healthy pipeline and hopefully, um, through investments, we will start in, 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 in the next year or so, be able to be thinking about those distribution strategies. The UK is a, a strong supporter of the COVAX advanced market commitments, which is aiming to ensure that vaccines will be affordable and available equity, equi, equi, equitably around the world. We're also supporting the, the vaccine research to try and get that pipeline of new products um, pulled through. Um, as well as some support for our domestic vaccine candidates. But as we do get to that stage of potentially having vaccines come through the COVAX facility and others, it will be important that just as we try and understand the gendered aspects and the demographic issues around COVID, we also start to think about actually how do we best use a vaccine to try and um, reduce the impacts of COVID and really move us and the world out of this uh, very difficult and extreme situation that we're all living under. Next slide, please. And just in conclusion, if I look forward, um, what I get asked in my day job as a, a chief scientist in government in the UK is, you know, how long is this going to carry on for? What are the projections? Um, and essentially, uh, you know, our analysis is that we you know it's very hard at this point to predict how long the pandemic will last and what the scale will be. And clearly, there's there's a lot of variables and a lot of variation around the world. But you know, it's likely that COVID and the threat of COVID will be with us for the next uh, next couple of years at least. Um, what we know from other infectious diseases is that they. COVID, and we're seeing it with COVID, is that they thrive on inequality and disadvantage. And the most vulnerable are likely to experience the most significant impacts, um, both directly from COVID and from the indirect impacts. The evidence that I've shared and much more evidence that's out there just strongly suggests that 
COVID-19 is potentially having a significant impact on our ability, on, on both approximate and distal drivers of demographic trends. Um, and although at one level, you know, we do tend to see that biologically women may be at less risk of severe illness from COVID, um, what the evidence does suggest is that women are more likely to be vulnerable to the secondary impacts. And, and, and I shared a bit of that evidence just now. And so it's clear that without action, without evidence, um, we, we do have a threat in terms of countries' ability to really achieve the, the demographic uh, dividend that, that is so hugely important. Um, in our own thinking about how to move forward, um, we're very much trying to think about how do we think about living in a COVID world and recognise that this is potentially a protracted crisis that we're living in. Um, that we, and I think that the key conclusions are that we need to pay equally attention to the secondary impacts along with COVID. We need to think about in our responses to COVID that we try and minimise the indirect impacts and that includes on the drivers of, of the demographic dividend. And we cannot be thinking about let's wait to that post-COVID world where we pick up these important agendas. And if anything, we really have to think about how do we continue to support investments in critical areas of development um, and support the appropriate adaptation so that they can be delivered as effectively as possible, even in the, the context of ongoing transmission. So with that, um, thank you. And I really look forward to the discussion and hearing the other presentations. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Watts. So I think we will move on to the presentation by um, Dr. Guzman. Um, and then if the Statistician General joins us later on, we will revert back to him. So let me introduce um, Dr. Guzman. Uh, Jose Miguel Guzman is a renowned demographer who was elected as the 2017 IUSSP Laureate in recognition of his outstanding contribution to the understanding of population issues and their relevance for national policies and programs. Jose Miguel Guzman's contribution to demographic studies and the improvement of public policy in the social domain spans several decades and covers a variety of issues borne out in a publication list of more than 20 books and 50 articles. He's renowned in particular for his key contribution to demographic research in the area of demographic transition in Latin America and for the great influence he exercised at the global level in areas such as applied research on policies regarding aging as well as population and climate change linkages. Uh, Jose Miguel has trained more than 400 demographers from Latin America and the Caribbean and from Africa in demography, specifically in fertility. Um, with this, this having been said, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Guzman and ask him to deliver his address. Thank you very much, uh, Diego, for your introduction. Um, first, let me try if I can share my presentation here because um, uh, it seems that, uh, let me see if I can. Uh... OK, do you see that? Yes, perfect. OK, uh, thank you. Let me see if I can. Uh, it seems that you have uh, you. Uh, it's me or it's you that you have this request control. Uh, this uh, okay for some reason. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, this presentation is about uh, like a introduction about what's what's happening globally and what is the impact, uh, possible impact of uh, the COVID on demographic dividend. Uh, I'm going to talk about some facts about COVID globally and what could be. Uh, demographic impacts and particularly how we can measure those impacts. One, we need to take into account in discussing and measuring the impacts. And finally, uh, about what happened with the demographic dividend. And in some way, I'm going to follow what was presented before in terms of the possible impact. Next, please. Well, let me start with some facts. Next. Uh, first, the first new uh, that came from China. Uh, early during this year was about the fact that the fatality rate was very different uh, depending on the age of the, the person that was infected. And, uh, and we identify like a high prevalence of uh, high incidence of um, the death in older ages, particularly after 70. Next. 
uh, we also saw uh, that mortality was also higher among older people, uh, but uh, but um, infection rate were not so different by age. You can see that the infection rate are, are not uh, uh, in a logarithmic scale are not so different from what was the mortality and the lethality rate. Um, and I think this was very important because uh, infection rate, with the exception maybe with the younger, are not related necessarily with the level of, 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 of with the same factor that influenced the mortality. Um, next. Also, uh, that not only that mortality was higher, uh, but also there was an over mortality. Uh, I take the example here of this pain, which we can see in the um, that the, the, the mortality by age for COVID follow basically the same trend of the mortality. This is important because what is said in, for many scholars is that the COVID came just to add a new factor that multiply the mortality in all the ages. Uh, it's not exactly in the same factor for all the ages, but it's not basically that uh, mortality rate follow the same pattern of uh, mortality rate, uh, the general mortality rate. But we, what we can see is that uh, we observe this over mortality of males uh, that is higher in COVID than in the general uh, mortality. And I think this is very important because that means that that show that the mortality is then not only higher by older people, but particularly for older men. Next one, please. One of the characteristics of the particular uh, what happened in, in, in Europe and in other developed countries was that a higher concentration of death occur in uh, residents of older people. Uh, we can see here that the proportion of, of uh, death uh, by COVID that happened in, in, uh, in home, uh, among care home residents was in some cases over 50% and even more than 70 and more than 80% in some countries. That means that in most of the country, it was the, the cluster of people living in older uh, res in residence for other people that was the most affected. Next one. What happened in Africa? Well, fact of um, um, mortality uh, by uh, in Africa, but also infection. We see that Africa with 17% of the population uh, the global population have only 4% of 4.1% of the cases and 3.6% of the death. That means that the, uh, uh, contrary to some expectation that the world in Africa will be highly affected, it has not been the case. Next one. We can see the, 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 in this uh, graph, the, what is the, the, the number of cases uh, uh, per day in a seven day rolling average in different continents. And we see uh, like uh, the difference, Asia with, a, uh, with increasing in the, the last month and uh, Europe with a first and a second peak. And the same for North America that is maybe approaching a third peak and Middle East very low, Latin America with a peak uh, some and still high incidence, but uh, low, um, but decreasing. And finally, Africa was very low a number of cases and more like a uh, um, normal curve of, of, of the epidemic. Next one, please. We can see here the, the, uh, what is the number of cases, uh, the weekly number of confirmed cases. And we see this, this trend with more details and we see that there are some uh, concentration in some countries. Next one. We can see now that in the case of cases, 75% uh, of the cases are concentrated in just 10 countries. And being South Africa, uh, the, the one that has the higher concentration with 43%. Next. In terms of the death, 47% uh, of the death occur in South Africa. And in total, 83% uh, of all the deaths occur in just 10 countries. So that is that the majority of countries uh, have been not so much affected. Uh, by, by COVID. But also it showed that uh, apart from South Africa, the country with higher uh, incident is uh, North Africa, particular, particularly Morocco and Egypt. Next. Uh, what, what, why this is happening? 
uh, why there has been a lot of discussion why in some way uh, the, the pandemic has spared uh, Africa. Uh, there are many possible explanations, but it has been uh, among them, uh, uh, it has, uh, we are saying that there must be some failure in counting case and death. We know that it has happened everywhere, uh, but we don't know that will be the only, obviously the only cause. Um, the decision regarding, uh, you know, the first measure to take after COVID initiated in Africa were uh, in incredible uh, fast in terms of use of masks, lockdown. Uh, uh, there are some people also talking about the possible protective immunity due to uh, the fact that there is a high proportion of people va vaccinated by B B C uh, BCG and, and also probably genetic factor, the climate, uh, there has been public, uh, an effective public health response and also the experience with previous uh, pandemic and epidemic in the case of the continent. But actually, next, we know that the most important factor is age, age composition. Age composition, we, in this graph, it's shown that uh, comparing Nigeria with Brazil, if both of them will have the same size of the population, we will see that in the case in the in the right side of the graph, you can see that the number of expected death in the case of Brazil is much much higher than Nigeria, even if we have the same fatality rate. In this case, fatality rate is that so that shows the importance of age as a determinant cases. Uh, also, it's important that in Africa the percentage of the all the population living in older uh, residents uh, is, is very low. So this is an old, another factor too. Next, please. Oh, let's talk now about, about demographic impact. Uh, first, before saying anything about that and showing the graph I'm going to show you, let me tell you that really we don't know too much about the, the impact. We have some estimates in the case of mortality. We have not in terms of, of, of um, fertility, and we have uh, uh, just a little bit in terms of migration. But let me show you particular how I think we should consider the, the measurement of the impact of demographic impact of COVID. Next one, please. First, I think I want to use this kind of uh, graph or diagram to illustrate what I think need to be considered. First, that there are four forces uh, that uh, um, that um, affect uh, the, 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 that, that need to be considered when we look about the effect of COVID on demographic factors. One is uh, the eruption, the acceleration, adaptation, and change. We need to consider uh, the short, the medium, and long-term effects. And we need to consider too that there are two uh, kind of effects that can we, we can be considered. One is the, is the direct, indirect, and also the positive versus vis-a-vis uh, -vis the negative uh, uh, effect. And finally, we have one major challenge that is everywhere, but particularly in most developing countries, is the lack of timely and good quality data. Next. In terms of disruption, we know all the disruption that uh, has been caused by COVID, job, school, social interaction, marriage plan, even research and data collection. Next one. Uh, we, we, what we see is the acceleration of that, you know, uh, processes that were started before have been accelerated with, with COVID. And uh, next one, we see two, uh, uh, an adaptation. We have to adapt. We have to work from home. We have to travel less. We have to use new weight of data collection methodology in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, of adapt to this situation. And finally, we have to change and uh, next one, please. And then uh, what is coming is a bit so different from what we have before. But I think what we need, we'll, we need to consider these four uh, components in order to analyze the effect of demographic factors. Next one, please. And next one, please. Let me go one by one. What is the effect of mortality? What I think is important to consider that you know, the effect of mortality, that is one of the, uh, because of the direct impact on mortality of COVID, this was, has been one of the, for which we have more information. We know, for example, the impact in terms of the life expectancy in some countries has been measured, seems not to be uh, so uh, 
high this number, but uh, maybe between one or maximum three or two point five of uh, reduced reduction in uh, life expectancy during the 2020, probably. Uh, but in most cases, it's low. In the case of Africa, will be very low. But what we need to consider is what we, when we look at the effect, we what we are measuring most of the cases direct death, those that occur because of COVID. And even in those cases, we know that this number of death has not been uh, correctly measured. And but even if, if we measure correctly that one, we just have part of the of the issue. We know that there are long term effects. There, in terms of uh, uh, disability, in terms of morbidity, that can cause in the future uh, delayed death. But we also know that there maybe one of the most important impact it will be indirect impact because of the decrease in accessibility, the quality of health services, and other <coughs> Next one, please. Next one, please. What about uh, uh, fertility? In terms of fertility, we have basically indirect effects because there is not a specific direct effect on fertility. If there is one, it's not really very, very relevant. But we know that the contraception is affected. There are increased difficulty in accessing services. There is a rupture of contraceptive supply chain. This could lead to unwanted fertility and increase in total fertility. Um, but we know that the period of fertility can go back to a trend shortly after if we consider only this short term effect. We don't know exactly what could be the medium and long term effects. But we have also the effect of nuptiality. Marriage has been postponed or are being postponed. Uh, in this situation, uh, the, probably the fertility will be decreasing. So there are two different effects one that takes the fertility up and one that can take the fertility down. We don't know exactly what could be uh, the final effect on that. Um, but it's something that probably will be affecting more in the short term. Next one, please. Migration is the most complex and less understood, probably, because we, we what we know in, term, in terms of short-term effects is that people had to stay at home, borders were closed. So migration uh, uh, and internal migration uh, clearly decreased, but also external migration because a country put restriction in terms of travel. Uh, so in terms of indirect effects, uh, what we think is that is the most important effect will come from these indirect ways, because we know that uh, more restriction to international migration uh, could uh, appear in the next month, in the next years, but also we will see an increase in internal migration because people will be trying to find job in a situation in which they cannot find. In some cases, they are in particularly in middle income countries and developed countries, there is a trend to go to the suburban rural areas, back to the suburban, but it's just, I don't think this is a trend that's happening in developing countries yet. But actually, we, there are a lot of uncertainties and very big uncertainties. Are we moving to pre predominantly online work and study? Are we close, are we close to an efficient vaccine? Will economies able, will be able to recover? I think those components will define what will be the effect of, of COVID or migration. And we need to consider that. But more than that, we need to do more study. There is not too much. Next one. The, one of the one of the few old data that we have is uh, collected by IOM that say that the internal uh, regional migration in, in, in West and Central Africa dropped by nearly 50% during the first half of 2020 compared with 2018. But we don't have too much data. Next, please. Next, please. So finally, what is the uh, whole effect on, on demographic dividend? Um, first, I think we need to see the, 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 the effect on demographic dividend to the two components of the demographic dividend. The demographic dividend imply a, a process that link to demographic dynamics, mean the fertility is decreasing, mean uh, the, uh, the proportion of people in uh, what we call dependent ages, Will be will be lower, and the percent of people in uh, working ages, particularly young people, will be higher. Uh, is this trend uh, going to be affected? I think, in terms of uh, fertility, 
probably there will be some effect on mortality, but less at in initially in terms of migration. But in general, I don't think that will be unless there is a change completely in the way the, the pandemic attack Africa, uh, I don't see that there will be a huge uh, change in terms of particular fertility and mortality for what we have now. The impact could be, be felt more in terms of long-term impact because of the economic crisis and the economic situation that will be affecting people. But I think the most of the effect, the effect will come through the change and uh, the socioeconomic uh, a situation. Um, th that's why uh, we are talking about how this uh, economic crisis caused, caused by COVID will affect investment, education, health, and everything related to those components uh, that increase human capital, which is one of the ways in which the country from Africa can harness the uh, demographic dividend. I, and I think that will have a major impact so in some way, what I see is a reduced capacity of governments for harnessing the demographic dividend. Uh, this will be for me, I, I think, the most important effect. Next one. How can this be uh, uh, avoided? Clearly, this is the time for enhanced employment opportunities uh, with a focus on young employment and education support with focus to the poor population, those that will be limited and affected, particularly in the context in with online education, which we know that the, the, there is the inequality affect uh, particularly the access to edu the good education. Also in terms of technology training, uh, uh, I think there is a huge opportunity in Africa in this area because we have seen how in many countries of Africa has taken the lead of including uh, uh, new te technology, uh, um, um, for example, in terms of vaccine, in terms of uh, use of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. I think this is something that needs to be strengthened. <coughs> Sorry, but finally, in terms of the increased access to family planning and all gender equity policies that promote empowerment of women. I think this is an opportunity for, the, for Africa to and uh, to increase this investment in this area as a way to at least mitigate the effect that will be felt uh, or are being felt now uh, by felt now by uh, by most of the population, particularly the poor population. Next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Guzman. Um, always very enlightening to uh, uh, receive your your view and your 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 perspective on on the theme. Um, <clears throat> I think we we are still having a challenge with the statistician general. Um, I'm just having a look at the list of of speakers, yes. uh, which I see he's not he's not he's not with us at this point in time. Um, but I, th I think then it, it may be a good time to move move from a global perspective to a more African perspective. And I don't know if uh, Senga Sumbeche from the African CDC is with us. I see I see the name is online. So I think we'll we will take this presentation next. Um, so let me introduce you to Senga Sumbeche. Singa Sumbeche is a public health specialist and epidemiologist at the African CDC. She has supported the training and mentorship of over 500 healthcare workers in the Tanzanian field epidemiology and laboratory training program in the area of surveillance, outbreak investigation, and evaluation of surveillance systems for 10 years. She has also supported the Tanzanian Ministry of Health, Community Development, Gender and Elderly in the preparedness and response to a wide range of disease outbreaks and uh, public health events. She is supporting the continental COVID-19 response at the African CDC as an event-based analyst, where she is involved in surveillance activities and has been involved in resolving some of the surveillance challenges that COVID-19 has presented. Um, with that, Sangha, um, would you please sh share your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for that introduction. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Um, so should I go ahead and share from my side? Yes, please. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see it. OK. All right, um, so I'm glad to be able to have joined uh, despite some of the challenges I had faced. But um, well, today I'm going to be sharing with you the African perspective to the uh, pandemic and try to answer um, the question that is on everybody's mind that um, why the trajectory has been different and um, what perhaps what lessons we can learn from this. All right, so uh, we're all aware of the global situation that um, basically uh, SARS-CoV-2 has managed to spread to um, the, the uh, very um, furthest parts of our uh, our world, um, having reached over 200 countries and territories, with about over 40 million um, individuals being uh, having been infected so far, and over 1 million um, uh, deaths have occurred. However, um, we can see that um, from the epi chart on our um, right that um, by the, uh, geographic, the WHO geographic regions, it appears that, um, or it's evident that um, the number of new cases being reported by, by day, um, it's uh, very different across these regions with the American region, as well as Europe um, uh, reporting more cases than other regions, and of late also the South uh, East uh, Asian region. Um, Africa, it accounts for 4%, uh, about 4%, approximately 4% of all the cases, as well as uh, approximately 4% of all the deaths. So, the outbreak involves initially um, in the Western Pacific region and later on uh, spreading to the other um, regions um, before having reached to um, Africa. And uh, initially, there were reports of large numbers of deaths coming from um, these regions. And hence, um, a large, uh, there was concern with how the outbreak would evolve once it eventually hits um, the African continent, um, which, as we all know, is, a large, is, is largely less developed and riddled with several health system challenges, as well as poor infrastructure, among others. So the expectation was that SARS-CoV-2 would rapidly spread and cause unprecedented uh, fatality rates. The first case was detected in Egypt in mid-February, and by the end of July, all 55 African Union member states had been affected. So on this slide, we can see it shows the trajectory of uh, the cumulative cases reported on, across the six WHO global regions. Um, beginning on the day each region recorded its 100th COVID-19 case. By um, having the same um, starting point of when each country or each region recorded with the 100th case, this allows us to compare how quickly cases are increasing in Africa relative to other regions um, when they were at similar stages of the outbreak. So this chart, um, the X or the Y axis is the log of the cumulative COVID-19 deaths reported, while the X axis is the number of days since the 100th um, case. The regions have been um, shaded in different colors as given by the legend, with Africa being in the dark red color. So we can see from the slope of um, these um, uh, curves, that um, we can see that um, the, it indicates how quickly the cases were, in, were increasing and that the trajectory for, Af for Africa, though initially it was uh, similar to um, that in the Eastern Mediter Mediterranean region, but um, 
it did not increase at the same rate as was expected um, as in the European and American regions. And with time, um, as it neared the um, 200 uh, day mark after the 100, uh, 100th, um, or the 150th day after the 100th case, there appears to be some sort of a, a leveling off of that um, curve. And this is um, ki kind of uh, similar to what uh, the curve that is um, for the Eastern Mediterranean region. So the question on everybody's uh, mind, as I said, is um, why is this trajectory um, uh, different or not what um, is ex was expected? So just to give a, a background to the uh, epidemiological situation in Africa so far, um, we can see, um, uh, looking close at the trend of COVID-19 cases in Africa by AU region, we are able to see that still there are disparities on how the pandemic has spread across the continent. And this epichart is showing the number of new cases uh, reported on the y-axis, reported by day, uh, which is on the x-axis, as well as the seven-day moving average indicated by the red line. So the number of uh, cases reported uh, essentially began to take off rapidly towards the end of May, uh, peaking uh, again towards the end of July. And the downward trend that we're seeing uh, beginning of August and all the way to September was due to a reduction in the number of new cases being reported from South Africa, which at the time accounted for about half of all cases on the continent. So, um, cumulatively, as of uh, 9 a.m. today, um, the African region has recorded over 1.6 uh, million cases out of which uh, for over 40,000 have uh, died for a case fatality rate of 2.4. Um, of to note is that about 82% um, of the cases reported have actually recovered. And so we can see across the uh, five uh, AU regions that majority of the cases are, have been recorded from the southern region as well as uh, the northern region. And these two regions also have the um, highest case fatality rate. And uh, for the new cases and deaths being recorded uh, every day, um, these two regions are also the ones that um, record the most, uh, the highest number of cases per day. So um, this uh, map is showing the cumulative COVID-19 incidents by AU member state. And uh, we can see that um, about oh, oh, five countries actually have less, have reported less than 100 cases per million population, whereby the bulk of the continent has reported uh, between 100 and 1,000 cases per million population. 16 countries have reported uh, 1, between 1,001 and up to 5,000 cases, while four countries um, have recorded above uh, 5,000 cases per million population. With regards to the death as well, um, we can uh, see that from this map that uh, the picture perhaps is uh, a little bit different across the different member states with three countries having reported less than one death per million population, 23 have uh, reported uh, between one and 10 deaths per million population, 25 countries have reported uh, between 10.1 and 100 deaths per million population, and um, only three countries have recorded over 100 deaths per million population. So as we heard from the previous um, a presenter that one of the uh, suggested reasons why the picture is somewhat different on the African continent is because um, the continent actually has the youngest uh, population um, in the world. And this slide is showing um, the how the percentage of the population with ages under 15 countries um, appears for the countries across the world whereby the red shading um, indicates countries that have uh, the youngest populations, 
um, as it progresses from red to orange, yellow, uh, green uh, would be the countries that have the um, oldest populations. So currently the country that has the youngest population in the world um, is uh, Niger, um, which I think has just about half of their population um, being aged under 15 years of age. So what is interesting to note, um, you can see the areas that have um, shaded, um, that are shaded with the youngest population, somehow coincide with those areas that um, uh, might have the uh, lower incidences and um, somewhat lower death. But again, um, we need more data to be able to um, uh, really explain how, uh, what influence the age has um, with regard to cases and deaths from SARS-CoV-2 on the African continent. But um, initially, as um, again was previously spoken by the presenter, that Africa actually um, took uh, measures quite early on, the public health and social uh, measures um, to prevent the importation and spread of um, outbreak. These were taken quite early on by the um, uh, member states, having um, had some experience or with, um, with uh, Ebola and understanding concepts around um, isolating and, co and doing contact tracing. I think the continent was um, some, somewhat uh, prepared to be able to embark on some, some of these social measures. So this slide is showing how um, as time has gone on, um, how um, member states have imposed uh, travel restrictions um, from March, whereby we had 32 countries in full border closure up to June. This increased up to 43, but of late now, um, um, most recent information we're providing is from the 17th of October. Um, only nine countries currently are imposing the travel restrictions. So from the epichart, we can see uh, in March when about 32 countries had imposed the travel um, uh, border closures, the, the number of cases was still quite low. And uh, as June came along, um, the, the trend was still upward. However, um, now, um, excuse me. Uh, okay. As um, in October now, with uh, countries uh, now requiring to 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 um, uh, to revamp their economies, and the pressure has been on to really open up um, borders and continue with um, economic initiatives. Um, as we can see, the, the re most recent trend we're seeing is an upward um, uh, trend in the um, curve. So uh, uh, one of the, um, uh, I can say, factors that has really contributed to um, succeeding in uh, not seeing the ex expected um, trajectory that um, the rest of the world, Africa, would go through is the result of the leadership of uh, institutions such as Africa CDC, WHO, as well as the member states themselves who have really um, taken up uh, different strategies depending on the stage at which the outbreak um, has has been. Initially, um, Africa CDC embarked on the PACT initiative, whereby um, uh, huge measures were taken to scale up tracing, to do to scale up testing, to um, do uh, contact tracing in the communities, and to have um, um, uh, to support the the case management aspect. And of late, um, as we think about opening up our economies and uh, resuming life, um, as we had previously um, known it, just to mitigate the, the um, uh, adverse uh, effects that, that COVID has had on our economies, Africa, again, the African Union has embarked on the saving lives, economies, and livelihoods in Africa which aims to promote the harmonized and standardized coordinated entry and exit of travelers in the African Union member states through digital platforms. So all these um, initiatives have really um, helped uh, uh, change uh, the story on Africa.
But again, um, just to uh, come back again to the question is why, um, as I said, initially the large number of cases were, was a result of Southern Africa. But now we're actually, what we're actually seeing is that um, as the cases are now um, indicating an upward trend, this is largely due to um, um, cases being coming from Northern Africa. And this slide is showing the trend of COVID-19 cases um, in the Northern African region. And it shows the first, the, the, the chart on the upper left corner um, shows the epic curve for the Northern region. And the other charts show the curves for Morocco, Libya, as well as Tunisia, who are actually accounting for most of the new cases being reported from this region of late. So in Tunisia, um, initially they had really uh, managed to contain or to uh, limit the spread of SARS-CoV-2 in, in this country due to some of the public health and social measures that they were instituting. But however, as um, uh, victory was um, close at hand, some of these measures again um, started to become relaxed and before um, anybody, uh, before, with, with time again, the, the cases have really um, uh, shown a really steep incline, as you can see from the chart on the lower um, right panel. So this is uh, very, it reflects now on the overall um, uh, epic curve from the northern region, whereby now the current peaks we're seeing are actually a consequence of um, some of these uh, countries. Again, coming back to um, East Africa, um, uh, of late, we're also seeing uh, an, an upward trend in cases from this region and Kenya and Ethiopia actually accounting for the majority of new cases being reported from this uh, region. Uh, we can see from the upper left panel that um, the uh, trend of cases being reported from this region um, in sept towards September, we could uh, actually see there was a decline in cases. And this again is reflective of what was happening in Ethiopia as well as in uh, Kenya. But recently, um, the um, government of, of Kenya has um, allowed for some of the social activities to go on. And so uh, that is now um, uh, uh, reflecting in the number of new cases being reported per day, which uh, late has been on this um, sharp incline. So um, what then have we learned? I, I, I understand this uh, webinar wants to know more about the demographics, um, how that is having an influence on the number of cases, but um, several challenges um, we have uh, faced in getting uh, this information from the member states. Um, we do have some information on um, the um, age uh, distribution of cases. However, this is very limited and uh, does not allow us to uh, provide um, very um, concrete um, uh, conclusions or explain who is getting sick in Africa, who is dying more. So that is a, a very big limiting factor. And uh, as Africa CDC, we're um, really embarking to um, really engage uh, the member states to um, uh, understand why, from a continental perspective, it is uh, imperative that we have this information just so that um, we will be able to um, speak um, uh, collectively and uh, embark collectively on strategies that can really help us to mitigate um, the spread of the outbreak in, in Africa. So the threat of COVID-19, um, as we are seeing in Europe, uh, whereby initially there was huge successes in limiting cases, is not abated. Um, SARS-CoV-2, unfortunately, is uh, quite an elusive uh, virus. And hence, we need uh, joint strategies and to strengthen regional and continental collaborations, which include making information accessible for, um, uh, so that um, we can inform um, response initiatives. So I have not managed to answer that question, unfortunately. 
but um, we can see from uh, try to um, speculate what um, what things could actually uh, work and um, also tr um, potentially use the advantage of having a younger population in Africa um, to um, to to bring down um, the uh, spread of the pandemic in, on the continent. So thank you for listening. Over to you. Thank you very much, Sangha. Um, those, that was a, a eye-opening presentation. Uh, I think it was much, much appreciated. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, checking to see if the statistician general is with us. Uh, I've just sent him the, the 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 new link, so he he is aware of that. And I think that before we take the presentation by the Medical Research Council from Professor Bradshaw, that uh, it's important that the statistician general's presentation be um, made so that the context uh, upon which the latter presentation can be uh, will happen. Uh, t takes place. Um, so I think if if um, Bernard, if you can maybe j just go through some of the questions that we have for now, I'm I'm going to just ascertain uh, what the status of the stat of the statistician general is at this point. All right, thank you. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions. Um, I'll try and see uh, which one. So one uh, to Professor Charlotte Wirtz uh, from uh, Jonathan Gunthop, uh, who says we are, we are looking at the new Lancet Global Burden of Disease report that estimates sub-Saharan population tripling over the next eight years to some 3.3 3 billion by 2100. Combine this with climate unknowns and economic unknowns, we are facing a possible implosion of the approximate and less proximate factors, in turn, setting up a possible accelerating vicious cycle. So, what do you think are the key messages uh, uh, highlight to uh, alert, prod, and support regional? to more urgent action on the proximate and distal determinant. Um, so that's, that's for Professor Charlotte Wirtz. Um, and uh, the, there's one for um, uh, Senga Sembuche who, uh, from Agnes uh, Gishohi, who, who asked, how do we account for countries that were not reporting uh, on COVID-19 infections? Um, uh, how how COVID nineteen infections are progress in Africa? So how do you how how do you account for those countries that were not reporting? Um, uh, then there's uh, there's also one here for um, uh, Guzman uh, uh, that is uh, from Nafisa to Diop, and she is asking about. Um, the, what's the impact of COVID on illegal international migration? Uh, since people will will still try to, to, to migrate, what are your views on that? So um, you can you know you can unmute your mic. Maybe I'll start with uh, Professor Watts. Uh, can unmute your mic and uh, respond to the question. And uh, okay. uh, yeah. Great. Thanks, and thanks, Jonathan, for. Uh, uh... A good question, a really important uh, issue. Um, I mean, I think that the projections that um, the uh, that are being produced in the global burden by the global burden of disease team, in a in a way, say it all. Um, that you know the projections for population growth, if um, the uh, proximate distal determinants of 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 growth are not addressed, are huge. You know and and I think what's important in the messaging is not about what, what does it mean practically? What does it mean about the levels of public services, schools, health services, and so on that need to be provided if those trends continue? Um, 
you know, are, are a core part of the message. And if anything, I think the analyses that we're hearing here is that those numbers could get worse because of COVID. You know, my view is, you know, from the evidence I was sharing, you know, I do not feel optimistic that we are going to be on a good population trajectory if we really don't take action now. I think the second part of the messaging is that actually um, there's the opportunity of the dividend, that actually if you really take action, there is this prospect of um, improvements in GNI, improvements in ability to deliver core services, an ability to have resilience to future pandemics and, and climate and so on. So there is also a clear opportunity if you get the right interventions in place, and that's that proximate and distal. And then thirdly, I think that the, the, the complementary message is there are actually things that leaders can do. Um, and that includes interventions across those drivers. It's also thinking about actually what we need to do in the light of COVID. And some of that includes, you know, how do we ensure that children go, do go back to school? We've had kids who've been out of school. Do they just never return? Or are there direct interventions that can bring girls, for example, back to school. The projections I showed were suggesting that there could be millions of girls who don't get out, who don't go back to school if there isn't proactive engagement. Or similarly, we need to capture, think about how do we catch up on um, immunization coverage to reduce um, infant deaths, for example. Again, you know, real, really progressive actions and rapid actions that could be taken to try and get us back on, on track. And thirdly, there's some really exciting opportunities linked to the innovations that have come out come about because of COVID in terms of flexibility of service provision, in terms of, you know, different ways of working, increased use of digital finance and so on, and also potentially provide new opportunities to get better on get on track and have more resilience to issues such as climate change, um, but also to to try and um uh uh, really enable us to think about the pathways to that demo demographic dividend that are slightly different than maybe um, we thought about uh, prior to COVID. Thanks. Uh, now we get an answer from a response from uh, Senga Sembuche. Uh, how, how is Africa CDC accounting for the countries that were not reporting on COVID-19 infections and how the how these are progressed in Africa? Okay, um, thank you for that uh, very important uh, question. Um, so, I don't know, in terms of accounting, uh, do, do we mean how are we talking about the pandemic in these countries? Um, or or um, is the question related to how Africa CDC has um, engaged with these countries um, to try to discuss this issue? Uh, Wanjiru Gishofi, uh, are you around to just clarify the question? But uh, perhaps I can take it from uh, both angles, if uh, just to um, save time. Yes, so, uh, Bernard. Yep. How are you? I'm. Uh, thank you. I was trying to unmute, and it was taking some time. Sure, I am around, and I think uh, uh, Madam Sega should address both angles. First of all, I was very interested in countries in terms of the data. Uh, there are some. We, there are still some countries which we have not really gotten consistent reporting, I, that is my, my point of view. And also from the other end, how is Af uh, CDC Africa uh, taking over you know, that, uh, that point? So I would think probably address both questions, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so indeed, um, there are definitely countries um, whereby getting information is uh, a huge challenge and sometimes um, not uh, coming at all. But um, as um, and this this really limits our ability to um, explain or to advise on different um, interventions and puts the whole uh, African continent at at risk. 
Um, currently, there's other countries as well who um, perhaps they do report, but not at the same frequency. So uh, essentially, this leads uh, to a huge uh, hampering of um, the gains that we can make as a whole, as a continent. And I think uh, in my last uh, slide, I did say that um, Africa CDC, there are uh, several initiatives that we're doing to engage with these countries one-on-one um, -on -one, um, to discuss on what's the best way that information can be transmitted. Um, we're uh, giving, dedicating a huge amount of resources to supporting uh, the testing in some of these uh, countries as well the um, capacity of our health systems, um, capacity of the human resource. So the challenges are vast and some of them are on a case-by-case -case basis. And so um, we're taking this really um, uh, as some of them are regional based, based on uh, disparities um, in how developed a country is. So um, for example, in the central region, um, uh, uh, this region is more, um, uh, the health systems are a little bit um, not as strong as are in other, um, other regions of Africa. So perhaps um, add more uh, the, the uh, interventions in uh, such a region are with regard to building uh, laboratory networks, uh, building the um, capacity of the uh, technical individuals. And uh, with other countries, again, these would be more politically based. And so we're really engaging the highest uh, levels of um, uh, leadership in, at the AU to engage with these countries as well. So it's not something that um, Africa CDC um, or African Union is um, slacking on, but um, we all understand um, uh, sometimes progress is not as fast as we'd like. and. Um, uh, hopefully, um, as time goes and as we build uh, that um, environment of trust in, the, in Africa and the world is uh, at large, then um, to be become uh, much more easier to get um, this information. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Guzman, uh, there, there's a question on, on the impact of COVID-19 on illegal migration. What are your views on that? And uh, there's also a follow-up question here uh, that says, to, to what extent can we look to historical data on impact of economic shocks on fertility, such as the Great Depression and drought events in Africa, to get the order of magnitude feel for scale and duration of reduced fertility, uh, so-called baby bust. And I, I assume um, the, 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 the person asking the question is asking this in regards to the impact of COVID-19. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much for the question. And uh, first, the question from Nafi. Uh, first, let me say hello. Uh, Nafi, how are you? How's everything? Uh, in terms of the impact of international migration, I think this is very important. What we have seen, in, at least, is that uh, the issue of migration, first, the issue of migration uh, had been a topic, a hot topic in the last years. Uh, uh, we all know that. Uh, what, I, what we can see is that in many receiving countries, uh, there are limitations because uh, borders are closed. So this is the first short-term effect. International migration has been substantially reduced because, because of that. But also, what I see is that the possibility that some countries will use COVID as an excuse for reducing or restricting more international migration, imposing more limitation. I think in, in terms of short-term effects, a long-term effect, I think that, you know, the, the demographic composition of the population in developed and developing countries is so different in many cases that we will see a continuous uh, uh, pressure for international migration and continued demand from developed countries for migration. So, uh, also we need to consider that, uh, for example, in Africa, 80% of the migrate the international migrants are uh, go from other country in the continent. Uh, contrary to some people think that international migration is mainly going from the south to the north. So, 
uh, it will depend uh, on uh, international migration in the in the future will depend on uh, what's happened with Africa integration in the next year after COVID. In terms of the second question um, regarding the um, uh, the issue of how we can learn from the uh, from the previous crisis, and I think yes, uh, uh, we have to learn from previous crises. Actually, in the nineties, at the beginning of the nineties, there was a lot of studies in the demographic. Uh, the eighties crisis on fertility, mortality, and migration, and there is a lot of studies in that area. In terms of fertility and, and mortality. Um, particularly in fertility, the main conclusion is that uh, uh, obviously, uh, even not only because of the uh, of the crisis on eighties, also for this um, baby boom after the Second World II, uh, Second World uh, World War, uh, war it was that uh, there is an increase during the crisis, and then there is an, a, a, an increase after the crisis. So in some way. There is an impact in the short term in the period of fertility or period of mortality, but not an impact necessarily in the generational, the fertility of generations or so the long term. But the point is that if there is a decrease on the number of people that, that take that affect the demand in a school, uh, medical attention, medical care, obstetric care. So I think that we, in the case of Africa in particular, um, I think that we can we can have an uh, an increase uh, probably in terms of the um, um, of what happened with mortality and fertility, um, but I don't see now that this will affect in the short term. Probably it will be more the long term consequences that we have to study. And finally, I would like to say uh, to something about data because I didn't insist too much in my presentation because of time. But because of the last question about the data, it is clear that we have huge limitation in terms of data. What uh, my colleague from CDC was saying about the difficulty in getting data by age is something that happened at the beginning in almost all the country. Now in European countries, developed countries, they have a little bit more data. But how we can measure the impact of mortality if we don't consider age? So actually, I think we need to really make the case for improving data collection in terms of COVID cases and death. Death is the best way to measure the impact of COVID because we know that infection, it depends if the people are tested or not. But even if we know that there is an, uh, 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 it could be an underestimation of the number of deaths, we need to insist that we need really more emphasis on collecting this data. Having only the number of people that die is not going to help us in understand understanding of the uh, impact of COVID, the demographic impact of COVID. So this is something that is basic. You know, it's like, how can we imagine measuring the impact of COVID if we don't, uh, a mortality, if we don't know what the number of death by sex and age, if we know in advance that in developing countries, at least developed countries, more than 80% of the death occur in older people. In the case of developing countries, it's a little bit lower, but because of the age structure, it's about 60, 65 in South Africa, uh, it's, it, it, but it's still higher. So I insist on the need to collect data, and we all need to advocate for that because our understanding of the impact, even in the impact of demographic dividend, is not uh, going to be good if we don't collect better and um, much uh, 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 and better data. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Guzman. Uh, Diego, uh, do we now have the intervention from your end? Yes, we do. Uh, thank you very much, Bernard. Um, so, firstly, I, I just want to apologize profusely on behalf of the Statistician General uh, due to all of the delays that uh, we encountered. He's unable to be with us today. Uh, he has a meeting with his minister, um, but he asked me to apologize for not, not being able to form part of the discussion today. So what I'll be doing is I will be presenting his presentation. Um, and then we can, we, can, we can continue with the program from there. I think it's clear we are going to overshoot the 5 p.m deadline 
but I think that discussions have really been in, extremely interesting so far this afternoon, and uh, I think it would be worth staying around for, for the last two presentations and any discussion that might f follow from there. So, um, with regards to this presentation, I'm going to make, um, I think the, 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 the main thing that we want to stress here is that, as other speakers have also alluded to, appreciation of the age structure of the country is essential, as well as of the epidemiology, so that an application of other countries to South Africa can be assessed. Um, that's that's really our main main take uh, from this presentation. Um, looking back uh, to the trajectory in South Africa, we are able to recall that on the 6th of March, the first case was was uh, reported in KwaZulu Natal, a province on the east eastern side of South Africa. For those of you who have not been here before. Um, and this resulted in a variety of projections regarding uh, COVID being made. Many of these projections were significantly off the mark because they did not take demography or epidemiology into account. Um, Jennifer Dowd, who Dr. Guzman uh, made, made reference to her paper in his presentation, used the age structure of infections in China and applied it to South Africa, Brazil and Nigeria amongst others, to show the impact of age structure. Um, whilst it was initially thought that uh, those over 65 and those with key comorbidities would be most vulnerable, data today shows us that the peak of infections lies between the ages of 30 and 50, and deaths between the ages of 50 and 65. So it is, it is unclear, and our colleague from Africa CDC has elucidated on, on this um, somewhat, whether this is due to the youthful age structure or whether we have uh, poor CRVS systems or testing regimes which do not allow for the uh, dissemination of uh, data as we would like. The epidemiology of South Africa must also be taken into account, whereby we have the history of HIV and TB alongside other communicable diseases. Now, looking at some data from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, we can see that the Eastern Cape, the Gauteng and the Free State provinces have all followed in the peak of incidence after the Western Cape um, over the, over the uh, weeks of the epidemic. So the, on the x-axis, we see the epidemiological week. Uh, week of the year uh, by the rate of incidence per hundred thousand persons. So we can we can see where where is it that we we encountered these peaks. Um, if we look at the number of, of cases, this was by mid August of um, male of by 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 age and sex. We can see that infections were as I said between the ages of 25 and 49, but were mostly female. However, when we look at uh, mortality, we see that the impact of, uh, of, uh, of COVID deaths is mostly male and uh, between the ages of 50 and 79, certainly a little bit younger than, than what was expected. Geographically, we see that all COVID deaths uh, are being concentrated in four provinces. Uh, the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape, as well as KwaZulu-Natal, which are the three main coastal provinces, as well as the province of Gauteng, where Johannesburg and Pretoria are located. Um, then if we consider the age distribution, we can see very clearly that the ages of 40 to 59 show the, the highest uh, rates of incidence, followed by the elderly over 60 and those between 20 and 39, but that the young between 0 and 19, which, uh, which, which are at the bottom of the, of the scale, uh, indicate their, their, their lowest level of vulnerability uh, towards infection. And finally, we also see that females have a high, high incidence uh, rate than males at about 1,100 cases per 100,000 population. So 
just stressing what I indicated earlier, that demography and epi epidemiology must go hand in hand, and the overlaying impact of geography must not be overlooked due to different age structures and different health risks in different areas. Now, if we look at the some of the findings from the 2020 mid-year population estimates released by uh, Statistics South Africa in July this year, we, we can see that the age structure sh shows that uh, children aged 0 to 14 and young people from 15 to 34 make up just over 60 percent of the population, thereby stressing the youthful nature of the South African population. Over the last 18 years, we can see that uh, children have increased from 15 to 17.1 million and the youth from 16.5 to 20.7 million persons. Um, with regards to the burden of, of care, we see how the child and old age dependency ratios have shown a decrease since 2002, with child dependency declining from 51.8 to 43.8 persons per 100 um, working age, and the old age dependency declining from 8.3 to 6.2 persons per hundred of those in the working age. Um, looking at the population disaggregated by sex, we see that 51.1% uh, of the population is female compared to the 48.9% being male. Uh, the age structure of South Africa's population uh, shows a typical pyramidal shape, um, and in in this case, we 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 can see two outstanding features being that of a surplus of females to males at older ages from 65 onwards, as well as a significant youth bulge between the ages of 25 and 39, which which of course uh, make make the South African population ripe to, to take advantage of the of the benefits of a demographic dividend. When we have a look at some of the issues related to fertility, age structure and migration, we can see that fertility uh, continues to drive the South African population growth and will continue to do so. There has been raging debate around children and the risk that they are exposed to and that they represent. And uh, I think up to a, a few weeks ago, the question on, on everyone's lips was, regarding whether it is safe to, to send children back to school. Um, concerns do currently still exist about access to reproductive health services, especially during the, the peak of the lockdown period. But consensus is that in tough economic times, fertility will slow down until the health of the population uh, improves. With regards to the age structure, uh, we take the, the, um, the, the, the estimation of death by the Institute for Communicable Diseases Consortium of Modelers that was made in May towards the beginning of the epidemic that there would be 50,000 deaths by the end of October. Um, this would equate to roughly 10% of all annual deaths with about two thirds of these occurring to those over the age of 60. Um, so we, we, we can say that age structure, particularly at older ages, might be impacted due to COVID, but there's no evidence of depopulation or a, or a reduction in population size um, that's taking place as a result of, uh, of COVID-19. And then finally on the issue of migration, with uh, lockdown and the closing of international borders, um, this type of migration has really um, ground to a halt. Uh, the main repercussion is amongst the payment of, of remittances, which is ex expected to drop by as much as 20%. And remittances are an important source of income because uh, globally they equal three times the amount of overseas development assistance prior to the pandemic. Um, the slowdown of migration has also re resulted in the hardening of anti-migrant attitudes. Um, due to the resentment of foreigners in the workplaces as well as in public hospitals, which is a, a an, an ill which needs to needs to be um, taken on or uh, um, resolved before it it uh, manifests itself in a much stronger way. 
from the side of Statistics South Africa, uh, it has released three waves of population-based online surveys during the most intense phase of lockdown. Uh, and these uh, surveys dealt with poverty, unemployment, migration, education, and health status. We also did three waves on economic online surveys, which assess the impact on the economy. And currently there's ongoing work that is being done on a vulnerability index that uh, should be released uh, quite shortly. Um, just as a snapshot, uh, th these are some of the findings from, from the third of the three waves on of the population-based online surveys. Uh, this particular slide and the next one is around the safety of children, where one out of four respondents felt that it was safe for the ch ch children to attend school. Uh, and eight out of 10 respondents felt that um, attending school uh, posed a risk to the children themselves as opposed to other members in the community. Um, and this here being a snapshot of uh, the vulnerability dashboards at EA level, um, which will, we will be releasing soon. So you can keep your eye open on the Status A website for that. So um, from, from our side, that is, that is all. Um, I think the, one of the main reason about uh, us wanting to present this presentation right up front had been to kind of to introduce various various issues and various uh, um, speaking points that that others uh, other speakers would be uh, ra raising and in in p particular I think um, one of the issues which the this presentation raised um, was, was was perhaps about the use of excess death um, analysis to determine the, the real impact of, of, of mortality due to COVID. And um, in saying that, that, that would be setting the scene then for the, for the next presenter to come on board and to um, uh, make the presentation on excess Deaths and this presenter is uh, Professor Debbie Bradshaw, and I'll quickly introduce her before handing over to her. Uh, Professor Bradshaw is the Chief Specialist Scientist at the South African Medical Research Council's Burden of Disease Research Unit, where she has led work on COVID-19 in recent months. She's an established researcher in the area of South African mortality and epidemiology. She trained as a biostatistician and has developed expertise in epidemiology and demography during her career as a researcher. Her main research interests are mortality profiles and health transition, and she has authored and co-authored peer-reviewed articles and presented papers nationally and internationally. She serves on several advisory committees in the health and health research arenas. So with that said, um, Professor Bradshaw, I'd uh, like to hand over to you. me unmute. Thank you, Diego, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me and for the participants who are still still with us. I think we've lost um, some along the way. Um, am I showing my screen? Yes. Yes, yes you are. Okay. Um, in many ways, the, the, all the presentations have kind of paved the way for, for what I'm going to talk about. And I'm really looking at the theme of, of data, you know, what, what's been learned about data with the COVID epidemic, rather than the specifics on the demography or the policy implications. Um, it's work that has been done in collaboration with, with um, colleagues from UCT's Center for Actuarial Research. Um, I'll try and catch up on time, but just as background, South Africa has a well-established civil registration and vital statistics system. And particularly in the past 25 years, completeness of death registration has improved but we still have challenges with the quality of the cause of death information. We've got a high proportion ill-defined. We've got an, a high proportion that are not well specified as to what the underlying cause of death is. And we've had a problem with, with um, distribution of HIV. 
But we also have a problem that, that it's a paper-based system and manual coding um, is, is done. And so we, we take about three years for the report on annual cause of death statistics to be released. So the MRC for some years has been putting out what we call a rapid mortality surveillance report. We obtain data from the Department of Health National Population Register. Um, we've been obtaining it on a monthly basis since 2001. And this is not all the deaths that get registered. We, we, we know that firstly, some deaths are not registered. Um, but secondly, the population register is only carrying the numbers of deaths of people who have a South African ID number. For adults, it's, it's really very high. And in recent years for, for children with improved birth registration, um, it's improved for them. And this report is focusing on empirically based estimates where we correct for, for under-registration, but empirically based estimates of mortality indicators such as life expectancy, infant and under five rates, etc. With COVID in mind, we, we investigated the pattern of the weekly data that we had in the bank. Um, which was up till the end of February. And we realized that the high proportions of deaths are registered within about two weeks of the death. Um, it, it's more than 90%. So at that point, we requested the Department of Home Affairs to provide us with weekly data rather than monthly. And we started to, to think about looking at the weekly numbers of deaths. Um, we realized that the, the, during the year, there's a seasonal pattern and that the numbers of deaths change. So we used a time series analysis on the previous two years um, to predict what would be expected in each week. The very last week of, of um, deaths that we report on we know are missing a proportion of deaths that are still to be registered. And we also, in the estimation, include a factor for that. So this is what it looks like. The, the orange line um, shows the, the predicted number of weekly deaths from all causes of death. Um, in the orange and the dotted line showing the 95% um, prediction bounds. And the black line is showing up to, here it's going um, into October, the, the number of deaths that had, uh, had occurred and been registered on the population register. You can see that in July, which coincides with, with what um, Senga was saying, we, we mid-July, South Africa had the huge surge of, of mortality um, and that it has been coming down since then. Um, we, we, although we could track the weekly deaths, we, we started to look at what we call excess mortality, which is used in, in AP and public health to measure the mortality impact of a crisis when not all causes of death are known. Uh, the, the definition would be mortality above what would be expected based on the non-crisis mortality rate. The problem is that the methods are not laid out. And we started looking around to see how countries were doing this. And this, for example, is, is the Financial Times um, showing the, the probably the last year in grey and in previous years in lighter shades of grey and the red line showing the actual numbers of deaths that were experienced on the one hand in Belgium and on the other hand in Brazil. 
And the difference between the red and the the yes here being taken as excess deaths. For us, it it became a little bit more challenging because when we started looking at this, um, we were well into the lockdown period, a very stringent lockdown. And on the top graph, I'm showing the deaths from natural causes. And in the bottom graph, I'm showing the deaths from unnatural causes. The unnatural causes being the injuries, the um, traffic uh, accidents and assaults, while the top graph being the, the diseases and, and deaths due to old age. You can see that the lockdown that included alcohol bans had an immediate effect and more or less halved the numbers of, of the injury deaths. But interestingly, the lockdown also appeared to have an impact on, on the natural deaths and the deaths from natural causes. Um, we, we're very aware that worldwide the, the influenza, uh, there's been a slowdown of flu um, and in South Africa, it, there has just not been a flu season. Um, Kitty's RSV has also been stopped. And it's quite possible, we think, that the, the hand washing, the social distancing affected other um, communicable diseases. So what we decided to do was to work out an adjusted baseline rather than taking the predicted value. Um, we adjusted the base from the, the um, 6th of May, we started tracking what we call excess, but we're doing it against an adjusted base where we track along what the, the time series would have predicted, but at a proportion lower to it. Um, to allow for the impact of lockdown. The second thing was to focus on natural cause of death and exclude the um, vagaries of, of the unnaturals that um, had dropped so sharply. Um, and we, we feel that this measure of, of um, excess deaths, that is the natural deaths against an adjusted baseline, is is pro is aiming to identify the natural deaths that might have resulted from the very direct and and related effects of of um, COVID. In not quite the latest week, but but uh, um, the end of the first week of October, the cumulated number of excess deaths we have is 45,706, sorry, 701. And that compares with the confirmed COVID-19 deaths that have been reported by the Department of Health, um, more or less three times the number. So at the time we had 16,600 confirmed deaths. The excess natural deaths against the revised base was more or less three times higher. Um, if we've gone wrong with our adjusted base and we just take it against predicted um, without taking a lower uh, a, a adjustment, it, it, it's taking it to 40 deaths. So we don't think we're too wrong. Um, and I think that uh, Charlotte showed one of these graphs right at the beginning, um, the blue line showing the um, excess deaths um, above the predicted, in fact, and the red line, which starts in about March, end of March, the red line showing the reported confirmed COVID deaths. And one sees this very big gap um, between the two. Um, it, I think one sees also that the, the uh, deaths in 2020 were reduced during the stringent lockdown and 
that we've got this gap in in the reported deaths. Um, it's hard to know exactly what those deaths are without more information, but there's a lot of similarity in in the temporal trends. Um, if we look at the provinces, um, I think that Diego showed how the Western Cape had started the epidemic much earlier and that the Eastern Cape had in blue had come in quite quickly and the the Gauteng in grey at the back has, has the highest number of COVID cases. Um, and the, the KwaZulu-Natal in, in the yellow mustard color sort of having a, a, a slightly wider spread as well. So this is not, um, this is a beautiful graph, but maybe it, it doesn't quite show the correlation if you're not familiar with, with the, the provinces in, in the country. Um, I literally kind of want to draw a close and, and the lessons that I would take from this is, and it's been raised with, by other speakers, the, there are worldwide challenges with COVID-19 data related to the availability of laboratory infrastructure and testing kits, as well as the testing strategy. And also, as well as the reporting protocols, um, we often find the data gets reported by date of, of report rather than date of occurrence, which, which needs to be taken into account. And I would venture that Sub-Saharan Africa is particularly disadvantaged with the lab limited laboratory infrastructure and limited mortality data systems. Um, the other is that weak of deaths in near real time has, has provided South Africa with an important bird's eye view of the pandemic. It has to supplement other data because it's not sufficient on its own, but it certainly indicates to us that the, the confirmed COVID-19 deaths understate the true impact of the, the pandemic. And the, we're strongly advocating for additional information because we, we can't at this point tell whether those excess deaths were definitely COVID-19 or whether it was some um, overburdening of the health service and deaths from other causes or fear of using the health service or even the, the stringent lockdown. But we do feel that the temporal correspondence across the provinces and the age pattern of excess deaths, and I think at this point I should mention 57% um, of our excess deaths are female and 43% male. That's partly to do with the, the age, um, the, the population numbers, but it is suggesting to us that the, the toll has been higher on, on women, and that's probably to do with the comorbidities that um, are experienced, um, hypertension and, and over obesity and diabetes, for example, as, as well as HIV and TB. Um, the, the age pattern, um, I'm not sh I haven't shown that to you, but it definitely, the, the rates go up with age, and at the older ages, above 60, for males, the rates are higher than the rates for females. Um, I think that's more or less all I wanted to, to share, but to, to sincerely thank my colleagues who work on this project, um, Ria Loebscher in, in the Biostats unit at the MRC does the data management and Prof. Dorrington and Moultrie um, help with, with the demographic analyses, and obviously to our Department of Home Affairs for, for providing the data. We have a website. Um, 
where we we post the weekly reports and and give the updated information. Thank you. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bradshaw. Um, very much appreciated. Um, I'm going to call on Bernard then to help me once again with the Q and A and uh, ask if we have any more questions or points of discussion that uh, people would like to raise. I'd like to maybe take advantage of my position of, as a moderator, maybe to throw in one question and it's directed to Professor Bradshaw. I think the, the report indicates that it's looking at excess deaths of people uh, over the age of one. And the reason for that being that uh, during the level five and possibly level four of lockdown, home affairs offices were closed for the registration of births. And so, of course, we, we cannot analyze a death of a, of a, of a child that is, whose birth has not been registered. Um, mm -hmm. My question is whether there is any 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 evidence to suggest that that situation has Im, Im, improved and whether the MRC would be releasing uh, deaths between zero and one years of age as part of the excess death weekly reports. So that'll, that'll be my question, but um, let's, let's uh, open the floor up to everybody else. Um, Diego, if you may allow me just to, as I was going through the, the comments, the, uh, the questions and the comments, just a couple of things. Um, I think there's one comment from uh, Elia Zulu, says that the most profound demographic impact of COVID-19 in Africa will be an increase in birth rate through short and medium term reduction in utilization of reproductive health services and reported increase in teenage pregnancies and uh, uh, marriages. The mortality increases will most, mostly be indirect due to decreased use of health services as well, especially for, for child health. Um, uh, there was an observation from uh, Dr. Uh, Wanjiro Gishohi uh, who says uh, that there seems to be uh, gender differences uh, variation in African countries. I think she, she points out to, to uh, you know, the observation from that last, last presentation that uh, women, especially uh, up to a certain age, seem to be, be disproportionately affected in, in, in South Africa as compared to, say, in, in Kenya, which she, she points out to and many other countries in Africa where well, the men have been uh, noted to be disproportionately uh, affected by COVID-19. And so she was asking if uh, there, were, there was an explanation for that. I think uh, uh, Pro uh, Professor Bradshaw touched on that a little bit. Um, the, there's one for you, Diego. Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, probably a clarification for so, uh, Belinda Dodson ask interesting comment about slowdown of migration leading to anti-migrant attitudes. The argument usually is that an increase in migration leads to anti-migrant attitudes. Could you explain? Um, and then, yeah, I think I think pretty much that and, and, and a lot of people also commenting on uh, on the issue around the data, uh, which is really coming out as a, as a major challenge in understanding the evolution of uh, uh, COVID and its impact uh, on, on uh, you know, various sectors, including the, on the demographic dividend. Thanks. Okay, um, let me let me perhaps um, acknowledge the, the contributions and the comments by various speakers. Um, that perhaps if I can answer the question posed to me, then we can open the floor to questions for other people. Um, I think I think the the, the question of anti-migrant attitudes uh, should perhaps have been interpreted as 
despite a, a slowing down of uh, levels of international and internal migration due to due to the compromised economic and health environment that we are in, that these anti-migrant attitudes are, are being hardened. Uh, we've seen various demonstrations in, in, in the Johannesburg city center and the Pretoria city center just last week, um, which uh, express exactly that and, and which uh, are indicative of a resentment of foreign nationals um, being in 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 a position of employment on the one hand and uh, of them working with essential services uh, such as those in the in the in the healthcare sector um so i think i think and i hope that ex explains the the position i don't know if we have specific questions to any of our other speakers Diego, can I take the gap and answer your question? Yes, please. Um, the, the mortality of, of the infants is really challenging, and the, the levels of deaths reported for children have still not reached where they were previously. So... We are going to be trying to to make sense of data from the Department of Health, you know, the district health information. But I am not likely to see this coming into the excess deaths at all. But, you know, in, in the annual report, we, we would want to try and, and get an estimate of, of child mortality. But it's a headache. Okay, thank you. Bernard, do we have any specific questions for for other speakers? Uh, no, not that I can see. I know there were a number of hands up during the presentation, but I don't see them up anymore. It's possible that uh, uh, a couple of people have dropped out who had questions. Yeah. Okay, um, that being the case, then let me allow uh, me to, on, on behalf of everybody involved in, in the planning of this, those would be our partners from the Department of Social Development, uh, Bernard and colleagues from AFIDEP, uh, the UNFPA, um, the UK High Commission here in Pretoria, um, and everybody else. hope I haven't left anyone out. Um, thank you very much to everyone for your participation. Please keep your eyes open on your inbox for details of uh, next week's webinar, which will be on the impact on service delivery, where we have uh, three or four very exciting um, presentations that we'll be sharing with you. So uh, from my side, thank you once again to everybody and have a pleasant evening.